Well, welcome today for another piece of critical information designed to help you make a decision about the upcoming referendum about the legalization of recreational cannabis. It's one of two referenda at our general election on September 19. You'll be asked to choose whether or not you think New Zealand is ready to legalize recreational cannabis. So we decided that we go around the world and get some expert opinion about the realities of life after <laughs> legalization and also just the realities of cannabis as a drug itself. Many of us will have heard that the cannabis of 30 years ago uh, is 10 times stronger now than it was back then, what's been dubbed Woodstock weed. So we thought it would be important to get some expert opinion around the medical realities of cannabis use. So it's to Ireland we go uh, to say a very warm hello to Dr. Mary Cannon. Hello, hello, Aaron. Well, it's great to have you with us, Mary. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your connection to this topic. Your expertise is around psychosis, around uh, particularly in children. Tell us about uh, your interest, your experience with this topic. Well, interestingly, um, Aaron, my, my experience starts in, in this topic starts in New Zealand because I uh, was working in uh, London with uh, Professor Robin Murray and he suggested that myself and um, a researcher called Louise Arsenault um, would look at the Dunedin cohort because Temi Moffat and Avshom Caspi had just come to work in, who were the co-directors, had just come to work in London. And... Um, so myself and Louise, uh, along with uh, Richie Poulton and Robin Murray and, and Temi and Absalom, decided to look at the issue of, of cannabis and psychosis because a very interesting study had come out from, New Ze from Sweden um, several years earlier showing that the, the young conscripts who at the age of 18 had smoked uh, high levels of cannabis had a six-fold increased risk of, of psychotic disorder later in life. And I mean, myself and, and Robin, we... we we were interested in risk factors for schizophrenia. And this seemed like a really powerful risk factor to look for. But I suppose the issue was, um, had these people been uh, showing signs of psychosis before? And the Dunedin study um, was really interesting in that they had information on psychotic experiences from age 11 and then cannabis use at 15 and 18. And then they followed the young people up to age 26. So um, that's, that was my start in, in, in this, now, I've never been to New Zealand. Um, I would love to go, but, um, but I was working on this New Zealand data. Well, perhaps when the borders finally open, we'll make you one of our first guests. Let's talk about even the studies you've referenced there, relatively old data back when the THC level in cannabis was comparatively low than to what it is today. How much worse are the problems now that the THC content in cannabis is that much higher? Well, it's, it's, yes, it's really interesting because the, 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 we, we, had, we didn't consider the issue of potency or strength of cannabis back then. It was just, it was just cannabis. It was just, as you say, weed. Um, it was just what people smoked. And um, th there didn't seem to be a big variety. But when we, looked at, when we looked at the study, we found that young people who started smoking cannabis at age 15 by age 15, had a four, four, they had four times increased risk of having a psychotic disorder. Like this is a diagnosis of a psychotic illness such as schizophrenia or schizophrenic form disorder at age 26. Now, um, and then Louise and I did, did another um, analysis looking at, it, using the results of all the studies that have been published to date, there, there were a handful of studies at that time showing this link between cannabis and, and psychotic disorder and showing that if you eliminated cannabis from you can do a kind of a, a scientific um, trick if you like or a mind uh, it's, it's it's this formula so you can you can feed in the what would have how much psychotic disorder would you have eliminated if you could have eliminated cannabis as a risk you know from the population and we show that about 12 to 13 percent of cannabis could have be uh, of psychosis could be eliminated if you if there was no cannabis now recently studies have been coming out from from uh, Europe, and there's a large study called the the, the European Gene Environment Interaction Study, and Marta D40 has been looking at this issue, and now she is finding with high potency, she's divided up into high potency and low potency cannabis. She's finding with the high potency cannabis, you're talking about risks fivefold increased risk, and also for those with daily use, 
and high potency cannabis. There's a ninefold increased risk of schizophrenia um, and, and other psychotic disorders. So this is clinically diagnosed psych psychotic disorder. So the, the risks do seem to have gone up. And the other very worrying thing is when they did the same kind of uh, analysis, this population attributable fraction, they show that in, um, in certain parts of Europe, such as London um, or Amsterdam, you could be, that, that cannabis appears to be accounting for 30 to 50% of all psychotic disorder in those areas. So they're definitely, the, the effect is getting stronger. Like we could pick it up even back then with, as you say, the Woodstock weed, but it's definitely stronger now. One of the interesting findings from this Kiwi longitudinal study was a drop in IQ among young people who were chronic users. How does smoking cannabis make you lose IQ points? That's a really good question, Aaron. And we don't, we don't really know enough about how, how cannabis is affecting the brain. Um, we're just, it's such a complicated um, substance. And there's so many of these endocannabinoid receptors all over the brain. We don't really know how it's doing it, but all we know is there's increasing evidence now that it is doing it, that can, cannabis is very, can be very damaging to the young developing brain. And in fact, you talk about the, the, the Kiwi study, there, there are, are two studies, in fact, in, in New Zealand. Um, New Zealand is, has, has two excellent longitudinal studies which have been studying young people since the 1970s. One is the Dunedin study that I mentioned, which is based in the University of Otago. The other is the Christchurch study, which was um, led, uh, and they both study about a thousand young people who, have, uh, who were born in the 70s, following them up over time. Now, the Dunedin study did show, as you say, a startling up to a six point decrease in IQ. And in certain cases for the very heavy users, up to eight point decrease in IQ over, over the lifetime for those who are using cannabis heavy from an early age. The uh, Christchurch study, and, and a very interesting study by uh, Ferguson and, and, and Bowden was both published looking at the general outcomes. Now, not just IQ measures, but I suppose IQ by itself isn't, isn't that important if it doesn't affect your life. But what, what they showed in the Christchurch study was that young people who used cannabis between 14 and 25 and increase in, increased use showed a drop in um, uh, the, uh, increased rates of dropping out of college. They showed uh, increased rates of them being uh, on social welfare later in life, of poor, poor just general socioeconomic class drop uh, later in life poorer finances and general decrease in life satisfaction. So it's, it's, it's not good for your brain and it's not good for your prospects in life, particularly for young people. There's something that the developing brain is particularly susceptible to cannabis, particularly the high potency cannabis. I had a mother come up to me recently in a meeting, uh, very forlorn about her now young adults, son's cannabis use that started in his teenage years. And her question to me, which I really wasn't sure of the answer was, can these effects be undone? Is there any hope for these young people once they've damaged their brains? That's a very good question. I mean, there's always hope, but you have to stop using it. Particularly in, in, in psychosis in my area, the, 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 the rate of relapse of psychosis, once you've, once you've been diagnosed, um, you may or may not relapse later in life. And the rate of relapse is very dependent on whether you keep using cannabis or not. And of course, the longer a psychotic disorder goes on, the worse the, worse, um, the effects on your life. Now, I, the, initially, it, it used to, I mean, a certain, I mean, are in a certain amount of the, what we call cognitive impairment related to cannabis, the memory, parent, concentration, and, and problem solving problems, um, they can be reversed if you stop using cannabis, a certain amount. Now, for chronic, heavy, early onset use, it seems there are some persisting impairments. And this, this, is, the, this is very worrying. Now, they may not be, uh, you know, we've seen up to eightfold risk in the Dunedin study. I've been working on some data recently, and we're showing that, that approximately, a, 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 you know, we're finding like a two-point de decrease in IQ. So a certain amount of it can be reversed, but some of it can't. And depending on, as you say, the, 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 when you start using and how long you keep using. Well, wind seems to be a really important issue in that it seems that there's this critical period during brain development in the teenage years where cannabis has a much more severe effect than perhaps for those who start using when, when they're older. Why is that? What's so special about the teenage brain? Well, the brain is, is 
the brain is going through all kinds of changes uh, throughout adolescence, um, right up to the age of 25. I suppose we're very focused on adolescence, but the brain doesn't stop developing to age 25. And I am particularly, I'm actually an adult psychiatrist, I'm particularly concerned with the 18 to 25 age group, because they are also at risk. Um, so the, the, the prefrontal area of the brain is, is the last to develop, and that's the area that can controls uh, judgment, if you like, and, and problem solving, um, and, and uh, you know, the ability to, to, to control your impulses. So it, 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 this particular area, you need to be, I suppose, if you're, if you're affecting it and, and, and damaging it in some way with, with a substance, this is going to have, um, you know, effects on those areas of your life, which are very important for when you go into adulthood. Um, but the, the, what we found, just to get back to your point, the, the, link with, the link with psychosis we found in the Dunedin study um, was particularly pronounced in those who started by age 15. But uh, we also found, which is interesting, we didn't make too much uh, fuss about it at the time, but the, the link with depression was actually stronger for those who started later in life. So you're not immune even if you start you know, <clears throat> later in adolescence. Well, you've mentioned a couple of interesting things there in terms of anxiety and depression. I've met many users who tell me that they use cannabis to try and manage the symptoms of anxiety and depression. And yet, many times we're led to believe actually cannabis mm -hmm. might be exacerbating or even causing those symptoms. What's the truth? I, th I think you're, you're totally right there. I mean, the perception, often people do say they're using cannabis to, to make them feel uh, relaxed and less anxious. Um, that effect seems to be coming from the, the CBD part of the cannabis. But the high potency cannabis contains a lot of THC, tetrahydrocannabidiol, and that is, that actually is anxiety provoking. Um, and we have shown another study I've been involved in, another longitudinal study of young people in Bristol in the UK. Um, and we published a study recently um, showing that high po young people who use high potency cannabis um, have a, a threefold increased risk of anxiety disorder, and, and this was, you know, this was still when they were in age twenty four, early twenties. They were they were meeting criteria for an anxiety disorder. So it definitely is not, um, you know, it, it, the scientific evidence is showing that it's actually increasing anxiety and also increased rates, rates of depression. Um, even you know, recently, Stormzy, the rapper here in in, in the UK, has has come out by saying. I'm stopping using weed because it's making me more anxious and more depressed. And just leading on from that, Aaron, one issue I'm very concerned about is the issue of suicidality. Because the, I, don't, I don't think enough is being made of this link, but a recent study has it pulled together. There's not a lot of evidence on it, but the, the evidence that there is there is really, really worrying. And a recent, what we call a meta-analysis, where you pull together the results of studies, has shown a threefold increased risk of, of, of suicide, um, you know, both, both attempted suicide and suicidal thoughts and completed suicide in young people who are cannabis, heavy cannabis users. This is extremely concerning. We've talked today about the impacts on, on the young developing brain, on those perhaps who have a genetic predisposition towards schizophrenia. And there'll be those who want to use cannabis who say, well, if I'm not young and I don't have a history of that, then this drug is going to be basically harmless for me to use. It's only a problem for those two very special groups. Is it really true that it's harmless for the rest of the population to use? The problem, the problem is, uh, Aaron, ca cannabis is, is a drug that people start using early. So it's very hard to disentangle this. Uh, there are not, you know, if you look at the epidemiology of it, the, there are very few people who start using in, in late adulthood. They've already started. Um, that, that's just the kind of drug it is. Um, so it, it's, the, the other issue is, is um, the, about the, the genetic. Now, I, I suppose we're, we're finding that, that um, perhaps the effects are less if you, if you start using late and only use very, very um, occasionally. Um, that's fine. Uh, but are you going to put young people at risk? Um, in order to have an occasional joint? Um, this is the question I suppose people have to think about. Um, we do have, you know, I, I worry about young people's mental health a lot and um, we must do all we can to, to, to protect them um, and, and 
you know, if, if they are seeing adults using the drug, then of course they're going to use it too. Um, are there, and any amount of education isn't going to convince them that this drug is harmful because they see older people using it. Um, the other issue I think that you mentioned, which is an interesting argument that's, that's used, that, that only people at genetic risk for schizophrenia or psychosis will, will be affected. That, that actually is, is not the case. Okay, there, if you have a very strong family history, i.e. lots of, of um, your, your family members have been affected with a psychotic disorder, of course you're, you're, you will be at increased risk of psychosis and cannabis is very likely, or marijuana use will, will, will trigger that and will tip you over the edge. Um, now, who is, but if you hadn't used it, then you may not have developed it. So in, in that case, it's, it's part of the cause of, of this. It's not the, the genetics as such, it's it, because you can't change that. It's, it's, this is something you can change. This is a risk factor you can eliminate from your life and you reduce your chances of developing this illness. And in fact, the, the, we don't, we've been studying the genetics of schizophrenia for, for decades now. Now, it's, it's, there is no gene for schizophrenia. There are hundreds of, of small genetic risk factors uh, gathered together and you can create a score. So, so we all have within us genes, small genes that can predispose us to schizophrenia. It's, it's in some people, they have more of a collection of these than others. And we call this a polygenic risk score. Now, in, in, interestingly, in the, in, in both in the Alspac study, the UK study that I've been uh, involved in, and also uh, the Christchurch study in New Zealand, they've shown that even when you take account of it, you can measure an individual's polygenic risk score for schizophrenia. Um, and even when you take account of that, cannabis will still increase the risk for psychosis. So you, it's, it's not the total story, um, but definitely there's, a, there's an interaction. The drug is cannabis, and inside of our brain is that endocannabinoid system. I've heard users say, ah, well, that must be proof that we're designed to take cannabis. I know, I know. I've, I've heard that too. Um, it, 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 it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Um, I, well, I'm not an expert on, on receptors. I don't study them. But, um, you know, you could say the same about uh, LSD or, or about, about uh, cocaine. All, all these drugs work on receptors. We all have receptors in our brain. It doesn't, doesn't mean... Um, that is a good thing to do. We're talking about recreational cannabis in this country because medicinal is already legal. And yet, uh, as you've mentioned already, sometimes the medicinal effect is, is present in those using a product that also has THC. What's your attitude towards medicinal marijuana? Are the CBD products safe or is the jury still out on just how medicinally effective cannabis can be? Yes, the, 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 the field of what we call... I, I don't like the word medical cannabis. Um, it's um, medicinal would be, uh, n they're very far from, it's, it's very far from being a medicine in, in the way we describe it. It hasn't gone through all the testing and, and uh, the, the randomized controlled trials and the, the, the proper evidence and the, 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 farm, you know, the, the proper delivery systems, the, the, the control systems, it, it, it's, it's bypassed this product has bypassed all of that somehow. I, I don't understand how, but um, the, the, in Ireland, we have a different situation. It's, it's only recently been approved for three very specific conditions for which there is reasonable evidence. Now, there, there's, there's two, two forms of childhood epilepsy, um, rare childhood epilepsy, um, spasticity and multiple sclerosis, and then uh, it's also approved for, for severe uh, vomiting in, in patients with chemotherapy. Now, the, the evidence, the, the strongest evidence is probably for those two rare types of childhood epilepsy, that the, um, the, there, there seems to be some effect in, in, um, in a proportion of, of sufferers, who have, it's, and it's a, very, it's a very distressing condition. But for other conditions, the, the evidence is just, it's not, it's not convincing. Um, the, there's very few what we call placebo controlled trials have been done. And this is where you compare to, 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 to you know, something that has no, has no effect, but, um, you know, will account as a huge placebo effect in all medicines where if people feel something is going to help them, then it is helping them. And that, you know, um, that has to be taken account of. And this hasn't been done properly for any of these, these uh, cannabis type products. Um, and I, so I, I, don't, I don't like the word medical marijuana uh, because it's not medical. Um, the, I also 
I suppose I also have, have some problems with the term recreational. I mean, recreational to me is something that, like um, surfing or skateboarding or something that's nice and good for you and, and, and makes you feel good and um, uh, healthy activities. But, but um, it some, seem, seems to have crept into the terminology in terms of... To, and it's, it's, again, softening people's attitude towards cannabis. That how can this be harmful if we call it recreational? I want to finish today by asking you to do something as a scientist you won't like at all. I want to ask you to look forward with no data, no evidence, just your hunches and your speculations. What do you see could be the future if cannabis is legalized and a generation of young people start using this high potency product? Many of them will get addicted. What does the future hold 10, 20, 30 years from now? Well, Robin Murray, that he was my PhD supervisor and he's still, he's, he's a wonderful man, he's still, he's Professor Sir Robin Murray now in the Institute of Psychiatry and he, um, he, is, he has a lovely phrase, he, he said, you know, uh, that Canada and the United States are, they're carrying out a, an enormous pharmaceutical experiment on the brains of their young people. So we don't need a crystal ball, we look and see what's happening in states that have, have legalised cannabis and you know, Colorado is one of the first states in the US and that's the one where most of the data is coming out from. And, and to be honest, Aaron, things are not looking good. Um, there seems, to, there doesn't appear to be any public health benefit. I'm talking from a health point of view. Now, I'm a doctor, I'm not a, 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 I'm not a politician. Um, but, you know, it's very hard to see any benefits from, you know, making making this high potency product even more available, and and the potency is just getting higher and higher, and the, the it's it doesn't seem the the black market hasn't gone away. The legal market is still there. It's it's undercutting the the, the legal market. Um, the, the emergency department presentations with cannabis related problems have are have tripled. Um, the, the, the doctors are at their wits end over there. The emergency medicine doctors. There is um, we have. Uh, really worrying as I mentioned before I'm, I'm very extremely concerned about the link with, with, with youth suicide and they're finding that that youth suicide has increased and that it, in young people who have toxicology taken after committing suicide you, you look at their the blood 30 percent of them have cannabis in their bloodstream compared to you know and 10 percent of have alcohol but 30 percent of cannabis in in on those those tests this is this is really stark um, and extremely worrying and I, I just would urge the people in New Zealand to, to look at where, where this, this has already happened and see, are there any benefits? And you can't see any. Well, it's just people talk about revenue that will come from cannabis, but no one ever seems to factor in the public health costs of, of a young person developing psychosis and having this illness for the rest of their lives or the cost of a suicide to a family, the cost of dropping out of college the cost of being on social welfare. No one's doing these maths and, and they're all talking about this, this tax revenue. And I think where people are trying to do it in, in Colorado, they're showing it, 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 it definitely doesn't compensate for the public health costs of this substance. <laughs>